I'd like to welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out to our lunch with the experts. I'd like to introduce Dr. Ann So, who is an assistant professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She works in thoracic and head and neck cancer and has a particular expertise in lung cancer as well as mesothelioma there. And she has grown up in Chicago and has trained and been living in Houston at MD Anderson for several years now. And also joining us is Dr. Alex Varavar. He's a thoracic surgeon at Swedish Cancer Institute, had done training at the University of Washington and then went to the Harvard system working at Brigham and Women's Hospital for additional thoracic surgery training before coming back to Seattle to join the thoracic surgery group here. A transcript as well as a PDF file with copies of figures associated with this program are available at www.cancergrace.org forward slash gracecasts. The first case I wanted to bring up is a 75-year-old Chinese man who has multiple medical issues that aren't particularly acute. He has coronary artery disease and atrial fibrillation, and he has a remote prior smoking history. He actually quit smoking over four decades ago, quitting in 1962, and smoked a pack per day for 15 years. And he had what's called a ground glass opacity, a small area on his chest CT, that had been noted. This is not a solid mass, but more hazy. He underwent a left upper lobectomy, so the top half of his left lung was removed in late 2002, and the pathology showed well-differentiated lung cancer, a subtype called bronchioloalveolar carcinoma, in two different foci there, and they were a few centimeters apart. They were both very small. One was a centimeter and one was 0.8 centimeters. And there were several nodes removed that were negative. But the fact is that with two different areas of cancer in the same lobe, by our staging system up until a new revision that is just happening, this is considered T4, so fairly higher stage than just a single focus of disease. If it was a single one centimeter area, that would be stage one. With two, this system would have it go all the way up to stage 3B. And that suggests a worse prognosis, but in fact that's not necessarily the case for this situation. So a lot of this happened before I came on the scene. He transferred his follow-up care to Swedish Cancer Institute, and he had CT scans over a few years that raised the question of, a couple of other ground glass opacities, which would come and go. And at least one speculated right upper lobe lesion seemed to be enlarging over time, but still quite small, yes, growing, but very slowly over time. And I'll show the progression over time. Not surprisingly, with a spot that is only growing from five and a half millimeters to seven and a half millimeters, he didn't have symptoms associated with that. And his lung function, and that's listed here at the bottom with FEV1, is what's called a pulmonary function test, showing that his lung function was good enough to be considered for additional surgery. Here are his scans. Obviously, this is uh, several years ago. And you can see that, yes, there is a spot that becomes more prominent in the top portion of the right lung, over time, but it's changing on the order of a millimeter or less every year. So I'd like to start with asking Alex, you know, it's not rare to have a situation where you have one larger or more easily visualized nodule and a background of a few questionable ground glass opacities. Oftentimes that one more dominant growing area is biopsied and shown to be an adenocarcinoma or specifically this bronchioloalveolar carcinoma, or BAC. When you see a patient who has one nodule but some background stuff that is questionable for multifocal disease, how concerning is that to you versus proceeding and ignoring the background stuff? I think in general, this is a classic case of bronchoalveolar carcinoma with respect to some of the issues that arise. This patient has already had a lobectomy is somebody who 
is starting to get a little bit older, 75 years old, has a smoking history. We're already starting to see that their pulmonary function tests are not quite as good as what we would expect had they not had surgery. This scenario brings to light a lot of what we think about when we see patients with bronchoalveolar carcinoma. 20% of the lung has already been taken out. One out of the five lobes is gone. We have some other lesions. It was bronchoalveolar before, and now you can see there is another nodule that's slowly increasing in size, and it sits right in the middle of the upper lobe. So as a surgeon, if we were to try to take that out, we have a 75-year-old gentleman with not great pulmonary function tests, resectable, could tolerate an operation, but would we be doing the patient a good service by taking out now another lobe to take out a very small lesion that's growing with time? I personally would elect in this situation to continue to follow, and I would not have a strong desire to remove that at the present time. And what are your thoughts? Because we often do see patients where we're struggling not so much with can we do this, but should we do this? And you have something that is maybe proven as cancer, in this case hadn't been yet, but even if you knew that, you'd raise the question of whether it's going to be clinically relevant in the next five or more years. Right. Well, I absolutely agree with Alex. I think in this situation we need to monitor the patient just very closely. He's already proven over two years' time that this is very indolent disease. And so I think in this situation we would advocate not going forward with surgery, even though it could be done, but mostly monitoring him closely because of the biology of the disease. And so our first credence is always to do no harm. I can easily say this operation can be done without a doubt. It's the question is, should it be done? And I don't think, given the information we have and given the location of that lesion and the pathology we have and the progression of its cancer, that we should move forward. Backing up a bit to somebody who has two or maybe three different spots of disease in the lobe that's resected, say it's the first time, that is suggestive that this is more likely to be an issue down the road and it may be metastatic. Does that make you, Anne, more likely or less likely to recommend systemic therapy after surgery? Well, it's certainly a consideration. This would be what we would call multifocal bronchoalveolar carcinoma. Um, all that means is that this patient has a different biology of his disease. And so while we bear in mind that this patient might have future episodes where the disease comes back in particular areas, we know already that this gentleman has very slow-growing disease, and it doesn't like to spread. It doesn't like to really do very much. And so he's very lucky in the sense that we are able to not have to treat him. And so I usually err on the side of being very conservative with these patients, and I don't see any great need to treat him, provided he has, A, no symptoms, and provided that his disease remains very well controlled which I would say by itself is very well controlled. Let's say a couple of years go by and he has multiple new foci that are growing. What would you be inclined to recommend for systemic therapy? Mm -hmm. Would you say chemotherapy in a gentleman who is an Asian remote prior smoker? Would you use the tissue that's already from a prior surgery to test for an EGFR mutation? Or would you want to get another biopsy at the time that you're considering treatment? Sure. In this particular patient, at the time that he shows that there is more disease growth, that would be the time we would come in and repeat a biopsy so we could look at their particular genetic profile. And if they are carrying a mutation in something called the epidermal growth factor receptor gene, or EGFR, this definitely would be someone I would treat with a pill called erlotinib or Tarceva. This pill has been shown in patients who carry this mutation to actually have incredible benefit for the patients. And this patient may be fortunate enough to be on a pill for a couple of years. Would you be inclined to suggest or recommend that pill therapy if you did not have mutation testing available? I think that that is a difficult issue because practicality versus what we should technically do are very different here. Technically, we should get an EGFR mutation test if this isn't a patient who has not had prior chemotherapy. However, the practical nature is it's very hard to do repeat core biopsies on our patients, especially in the lung, and there are certain complications that could occur. 
I would prefer to see an EGFR mutation status on the tissue for any patient period. However, there are some patients that are more likely to carry this mutation. Those would be patients who have adenocarcinoma histology, those who are Asian, women, and these are all patients who usually have never smoking history or less than 15 pack year smoking history. That's not to say though that a man who has a 20 pack year smoking history couldn't carry the mutation, they could, provided they have an adenocarcinoma histology. If a patient had all the clinical hallmarks that make them more likely to carry the mutation, and I absolutely could not get any tumor tissue on them, sometimes on a practical side, you might want to go ahead and treat them with the Terceva, but you have to follow them very closely. You have to see them at four weeks and make sure that the drug is working. Because if the drug is not working, you need to immediately put that patient onto chemotherapy. Now, there could also be an argument said that in those patients where you can't get the EGFR mutation, you should automatically go to chemotherapy and then sequence them and give them an EGFR inhibitor later. I don't think that we know the answer to that. Right now, either which way, I think would be clinically acceptable for the treatment of the patients. This is an old look at what PET scans would show several years ago, and not surprisingly, the PET uptake was not even perceptible, very low. He actually had undergone a VATS wedge resection, so a video-assisted thoracic surgery, and a wedge resection, which is less than a full lobectomy. And he had some modest complications with some atrial fibrillation. He was in the ICU for a little while, but he recovered from that and did not have a big surgery where they took out lymph nodes, but did have an 8-millimeter well-differentiated BAC. Alex, in general, whether it's the first surgery or a subsequent surgery, how do you feel about a lobectomy versus a sublobectomy, a wedge resection or a segment in this situation for, say, a one-centimeter well-differentiated BAC? If I knew the pathology and the pathology clearly told me that it was a BAC, I would have absolutely zero reservations doing a sublobectomy operation. I do not think BACs need to have an anatomic resection. In fact, I think it's preferable to preserve as much lung as you can for this exact reason. If additional lesions come up over the course of several years, you don't want to have already taken out more lung than the patient's going to be able to tolerate in the future and require oxygen and have difficulty with their breathing. So that assumes that we know it's BAC. And if we do, then I'm comfortable doing less than a lobectomy. If I could add, one of the new technologies that's under development is stereotactic radiosurgery, which, you know, not to detract from our surgeons, but that is a possibility to try to spare lung tissue in patients that may not be the best surgical candidates also. And that's really something that we haven't looked at very much. It's come onto the scene so recently. And in truth, a lot of patients would really prefer to have it out if they can, but I agree that that idea of trying to control what is likely to be a very controllable cancer while causing as little collateral damage and losing lung tissue is an attractive idea. And the idea behind the sublobectomy, can you talk about what evidence there is in Japan or the United States to support the concept? We've found that BACs tend to recur with time there have been certain classification systems that have been developed, in particular the Noguchi classification system. If you have a BAC and they're not very large, we've found that with Noguchi A and Bs, which tend to be smaller, that literature supports doing a sub-lobar resection in this scenario. And a little different situation, but let's say you have somebody who has a four and a half centimeter BAC with some solid component, and it's not majority invasive, but there's some invasive adenocarcinoma and a lot of non-invasive BAC, which is a common mm -hmm. situation that it's not pure, mm -hmm. but a mixture of some invasive and some non-invasive. Does that make you less inclined to suggest adjuvant chemotherapy postoperatively to reduce the risk of the cancer, either because you think it's less likely to recur than other cancers or because it's not as likely to respond to chemo as a BAC? BAC is tough because it's usually less than 3% of all lung cancers, so it tends to be a little bit more rare. We understand now that there's a wide spectrum of BAC. That's why there's so many classification systems that have been created for it. If one had 
a primarily invasive adenocarcinoma component. That is a little bit more of an aggressive phenotype than just a pure BAC. And in those patients, I would be more inclined to treat them as if they were a pure adenocarcinoma patient. So if they had no other evidence of disease elsewhere, they had a resection for a four centimeter tumor that was primarily predominantly adenocarcinoma, I would pretty much go to the adjuvant treatment guidelines, which do suggest that for stage 1B patients who have a four centimeter or greater tumor, that they do get some benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. So in that patient, I would consider that. But I would also test them to see if they have the EGFR mutation. And if they did, then I would consider giving them adjuvant Terceva. That's interesting because it is something we scratch our heads about now because we don't have data showing a benefit with Tarceva in the adjuvant setting, and yet if we knew someone had a mutation, that's exactly the person you'd think would benefit the most from it. Mm -hmm. There is a phase three clinical trial ongoing right now called the Radiant Study that is looking at adjuvant Tarceva, which hopefully we'll get some data from that and we'll know more. And I think from a surgical standpoint, as those lesions become larger, four, five centimeters, and have components that are solid in them, it makes a surgeon more worried that we're dealing with more than just BAC. In that scenario, I would more likely want to do a lobectomy and a lymph node dissection. As in the case that you presented, after the first, once you have as much pathology as you have, and we know what we're dealing with, then I'd feel more comfortable going on with a sublobar resection. Mm -hmm. But in the scenario that you just presented, I would not feel comfortable with a wedge.